have a lot of information to cover tonight, and I'm not just whistling Dixie. So I hope, does everyone have the study guide? You're going to need that. And do you have a pen? Okay, you might want to flex your wrists and stretch your fingers and do all of that. If you didn't get a study guide, raise your hand and we'll have our ushers bring you one. should say number five, The War Behind the Wars, part one. The War Behind the Wars, Part 1. We're going to begin with a word of prayer, and we're going to dive right in at top speed. Let's begin. Father in heaven, please, as we spend this time together this evening, we are anticipating a blessing, not just because of a man, hardly, Father. In fact, tonight we're asking that you will bless in spite of this man. We ask that you will open our hearts as we open your word, and may we understand with clarity and with biblical accuracy the war that is taking place behind the wars. We ask this in the name of our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Let's go directly to our study guide, The War Behind the Wars. It says, reading the first paragraph there, we live in an age in which, sadly, war is what, everyone? Common. All war is ugly. The loss of life and resources from war is inestimable. Even so-called just wars leave a trail of residual suffering and death that extends beyond the punishment directed toward the offender. The pain and despair created stretches for years and decades into future generations. In the last 150 years, this planet has witnessed the most deadly and terrible wars ever. We spent a little time talking about that the other evening in our Signs of the Times survey. It goes on, yet as horrific as these wars were and are, they are comparatively insignificant to the first war ever fought. This first war had the most terrible ramifications and consequences. In fact, all wars since that war are the direct result of the first war. Worse yet, that first war is still being, what is that everyone? Fought. And the battle is intensifying, not abating. In order to understand the book of Revelation, we must grasp the profound significance of this first war. It really sets the backdrop for the entire book. This is exactly what we will attempt to do in this lesson. We will discover that we are all very involved in this great war, the war behind the wars. Now, the last time we were together, we looked at this individual named Lucifer, an exalted angel who by his own choice, by his own what everyone? Choice became Satan or Satan, the fallen foe. You remember that the word Satan comes from a transliteration of the Hebrew word Satan. It means enemy or adversary, one who is against. We made that remarkable statement. Might have sounded a little shocking to you. We said God did not create Satan. Rather, God created Lucifer, and Lucifer by his own choice became Satan. Now, if that makes sense, I want you to say amen. Amen. Now, the book of Revelation, as we have already discussed, contains 404 verses. A full 270 of those are taken directly from the what, everyone? Old Testament. That's more than two-thirds. It means if we're going to understand the book of Revelation, we have to remember those keys that we learned in our opening presentation. Key number one, the book of Revelation rests upon the broad foundation of the Old Testament. The what, everyone? Old Testament. And who is the focus of the book of Revelation? Remember that? Jesus Christ. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's exactly right. And so tonight what we're going to try and do is understand one of the most pivotal, important chapters in all of Revelation. Now you might be saying, wait a minute, we're studying the book of Revelation. We should start in chapter 1, verse 1. We've already said this, but it probably bears repeating. The book of Revelation is not organized chronologically. There are chronological elements, but for the most part, the book of Revelation is order, organized thematically. That is topically or along themes. And many scholars and commentators agree that probably the chapter more than any other chapter that really sets the tone and the theme of the book of Revelation is Revelation chapter 12. And that's why we're beginning there. So open your Bibles to the last book of the New Testament, the wonderful, sometimes mysterious book of Revelation. You'll notice we're moving quite fast because we have a lot of information to cover tonight. Revelation 
chapter 12. Now we're going to do something here a little unusual. I'm going to read the entire chapter through. The reason we're going to do that is it's going to give us an airplane view of what to expect in this chapter. There are 17 verses, and as we read through it, I want you to allow your mind to try and grasp, use your imagination to try and grasp the profoundness of the imagery and the amazing, fantastic images found there. We're in Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Now, I will read quite quickly, but you can follow along there. It says, Now a great sign appeared where, everyone? In heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Notice, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Verse 2, Then she, being with child, cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great, fiery, red, what everyone? Dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness. There she has a place prepared for her by God that they should feed her there. One thousand... 260 days. Just very quickly, that is one of the most important time elements in all of the Bible. We'll spend more time on that later. Verse 7, and war broke out, where everyone? In heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Verse 9, notice carefully there is one word that occurs three times in verse 9. See if you can pick it up. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Did you pick the word up? What is it? Yeah. Cast. Verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. There it is again. Verse 11. And they overcame him, him being Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, there it is, five times he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Verse 17, the climax of the entire chapter. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make... War with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen? I mean, a very, very powerful chapter. Now look at your study guide, and what we're going to discover here is that there are essentially five major elements in Revelation chapter 12. That is five major elements that if we can understand these elements, we can get our hands and our fingers wrapped around what is being communicated here in this pivotal chapter. The first thing that we are introduced to is the woman. The what, everyone? The woman. the woman. Remember, she was standing on the moon. She was clothed with the sun, and she had a garland of stars upon her head. What does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? A woman in Bible prophecy. Well, there are several passages that we could look at. Just very quickly, you can write these down. I will quote them for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, the Apostle Paul says, I have espoused you as a chaste virgin to Christ. In other words, the New Testament church, he says, was a woman. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 2, the prophet Jeremiah says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman woman. So in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, God's people were symbolized by a woman. By a what, everyone? A woman. What we find in Revelation is that a pure, chaste woman would represent God's true people or God's true church. And a harlot woman would represent an unfaithful or an untrue church. If that makes sense, everyone say amen. amen. We've already seen a powerful, pivotal interpretive mechanism here, an interpretive device. A woman represents God's people. But we go on. The second element is the wily dragon. 
Notice that this dragon is described as being a hideous creature, having seven heads and ten horns. He's a hideous, grotesque creature, contrasted with the beautiful chastity and sublimity of the woman that we saw there in verse 1. The next element that we are introduced to, of course, the dragon is Satan, according to verse 9. You can read that, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil, and who, everyone? Satan. The next element that we're introduced to is the war. Look at verse 7. This verse is almost uh, hard to believe. It's very difficult for us to understand. It says, and war broke out in Afghanistan. I mean, that wouldn't be surprising at all, would it? And war broke out in Afghanistan. War broke out in the Middle East. Ooh, yeah, we've heard that before. But notice what it says. There was war in heaven. I mean, of all places for there to be war, war in heaven. Now, here is a critical point, and I want you to make a note of this on your study guide there. Notice that this war begins in heaven, but this war finishes on earth. Did you notice that transition? Look at it there. Verse 7 says, war broke out in heaven, but then jump down to verse 17. The dragon was enraged with the woman. Who's the woman? It's God's people, the church, and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That is a critical point that we will exploit further as we get into our study. This war began where, everyone? In heaven, but this war will be finished where, everyone? Right here on earth. The third element is the war. Now, the fourth element is one that's not mentioned exactly by name, but it is there. Look at verse 11. How is it that God's faithful people overcome the dragon and overcome Satan? Verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb, everyone? Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's what John the Baptist said when he was standing up to his waist in the muddy waters of the River Jordan. Behold the Lamb of God. That word Lamb occurs 26 times times in the book of Revelation, and every time except one, it refers to Jesus Christ. Ooh, that probably got your curiosity up. You're going to go and try and find the one that doesn't refer to Jesus. I'll give you a hint. It's in Revelation chapter 13. But the weapon by which we use to overcome Satan is not our hands, it's not our strength, it's not our fists, it's the blood of Jesus Christ. Can someone say amen? amen. Notice it says in the rest of that verse, and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Revelation's weapon is the cross of Jesus Christ and the Christ of that cross. We'll spend more time on that in our next lesson. The fifth element is the winners. Hallelujah, the devil is not the victor in the final analysis. There are many times today when the devil definitely gets the upper hand. There are many times today when it appears as though the devil wins the battle. But here's the good news. Though he may win a battle here and there, he is not going to win the war. Can someone say amen? amen? God is going to finish what he started. You see that there in verse 17. And the dragon was enraged. The old King James says wrath. It means absolutely, totally furious with the woman. That is the true people of God. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Now notice there at the bottom of your study guide, it says, what does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? You tell me what it is. Church. It's a church, or if you prefer, the people of God. I sometimes don't say the church, and the reason for that is a woman was also a representative of God's people in the Old Testament, but really the church is more of a New Testament phenomenon. I prefer to say God's people. The winners will be God's faithful people. Now if we can understand these five elements, the woman, who is she? The dragon, who is he? The war, what's it all about? The weapon, how do we employ that weapon? And the winners, who in the final analysis will overcome? This will really help us to get our fingers wrapped around this monumental and pivotal chapter. I'm on page two now of the study guide. The two supporting texts there that you would write down are number one, 2 Corinthians 11.2 and Jeremiah 6.2. Literally, we could give another 20 texts to show that a woman in Bible prophecy represents God's people on earth, but that should suffice. According to verse 9, what does the dragon represent, everyone? Satan. Satan, that's right. And more than any other chapter in the book, Revelation chapter, what chapter is it? 12 describes the great battle that is waging between the forces of light and darkness, good and evil. This chapter pulls back the curtain that separates the seen from the unseen and enables us to see what is going on behind the scenes. In order to grasp Revelation as a whole, we must understand this chapter. 
Many scholars and commentators agree that this chapter represents the focal point, the pinnacle of the entire book of Revelation. Now let us go to the Eden to Eden subheading. In the beginning, as we've already discussed, everything was good, very good. Can you say amen to that? We spent time on that our last time together. We looked in it, and it says seven times there in Genesis 1, God saw that it was good, that it was good, that it was good, that it was good, etc., etc. So in the beginning, it was very good. Now, here's something absolutely remarkable. If you take your Bible and hold it up just like this, why don't you do that? Hold your Bible up just like this. Now, to the uninitiated, the Bible looks like a single book, but it's not a single book. As a matter of fact, the Bible is more like an encyclopedia than a single book. There are how many books in this codex? 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. Now here's something remarkable. This is a very powerful interpretive device. If you go this side, that is the Genesis side, the first two chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, we find a perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people in a perfect environment. That's Genesis 1 and 2, before the entrance of sin. Again, a perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people in a perfect environment. No sin. Can you say amen to that? But here's something that's absolutely remarkable. If you go to this side of your Bible and you go this direction, that is the Revelation side, the last two chapters of the Bible depict the very same thing. A perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people in a perfect environment. In other words, on this side of the Bible, you have Eden. You have what, everyone? Eden. And on this side of the Bible, you have Eden restored. Eden what, everyone? Restored. And so in, in a very real way, these two Edens function like bookends. You know how that is. When, when you have a whole line of books and you don't have a wall or something to stack them up against, you have a bookend on this side and a bookend on this side. And that's what we find on either side of these 66 books here in the Bible. A perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people in a perfect environment. And here on the Revelation side, the very same thing. A perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people in a perfect environment. Now, if that makes sense, say amen. So everything in between these two Edens is God trying to get his people back from where they fell. Does that make sense? Yeah. They began there and they will be restored there. Go to your study guide. The Bible is more easily understood against the backdrop of the original state of man and this planet. That's what you'd write in there. As contrasted with the fallen state of man and this planet. In the beginning, before the entrance of sin, we see a perfect couple in a perfect communion with a perfect God. That's what you'd write in there. This is described in Genesis 1 and 2. The couple lived in the Garden of Eden. Significantly, when we move from the first two chapters of the Bible to the last two, Revelation 21 and 22, we find the very same thing. Namely, a perfect people in perfect communion with a perfect God. Now, the next paragraph says, note the following diagram. The left line, the left vertical line, would represent Eden. You can write that there, Eden. The right line, the right vertical line, would represent Eden restored. And so just as we have two on either side of the Bible, we have Eden and Eden restored, so too here on our diagram, Eden on the left, Eden restored on the right. The cross in the center symbolizes the death of Jesus Christ that rescues believers from the downward spiral of sin. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Tracing a line downward toward the cross from the left represents man's downward spiral into sin, selfishness, and death. Then, tracing a line upward from the cross to the top of the right line symbolizes man's potential recovery if the salvation secured for him or her on the cross is personally received. That's what you'd write in there. Personally received. Beloved, never forget this. You will be saved as an individual. You will be saved because of a personal relationship with God. Because of a what, everyone? Personal relationship. You can't go to heaven on the coattails of your spouse. Can someone say amen? Neither can you go to heaven on the coattails of your family. Sometimes I ask people, I say, How long have you been a Christian? And they'll say, I was raised a Christian. You weren't raised a Christian. 
No one has raised a Christian in the sense that God does not have grandchildren. God only has children. Does that make sense, everyone? Yes. We make our own decision, our personal choice to entrust our case to Christ. And so when Christ died there on the cross 2,000 years ago, that is an a historical event. But we must accept that historical event personally in order for it to benefit us in the ultimate sense. Can someone say amen? amen? We are not universalists. The Bible does not teach universalism that everyone will be saved. Hardly. In fact, Jesus on one occasion said, there's a great big wide way and many people are going that way and it leads to destruction and then there's a narrow way and it leads to eternal life. Are we all on the same page, everyone? Yes. That's Eden to Eden restored. Now you go to the third page there of your study guide. Now this is awesome. Hang in there. This is where things really get amazing. I'm reading here from the study guide. Not only are there two Edens like bookends on the entire Bible, there are also two battles. Two what, everyone? Yeah. Battles that act very much the same way. Now, you can go ahead and fill in the blanks there. I'll explain it without looking at the study guide. Now just imagine with me, for illustration's sake, that over here on this side of the stage, this is Genesis, okay? Then we'd walk all the way through the Bible, through Psalms, through Isaiah, through the New Testament, and over here is Revelation. So what's over here, everyone? Revelation. And what's over here, everyone? Genesis. So here we have Eden, and over here we have? Eden restored. You've got it. Now, over here, Eden, is Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. A perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people in a perfect environment. Now. If I stepped one chapter this way, one chapter this way from Eden, what chapter would I be in? Three. Genesis chapter three. three. That's exactly right. Open your Bible to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three. Beginning in verse one, a familiar story. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now I'm in verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. God had said in the day that thou eatest thereof, four words, thou shalt surely die. But Satan here inserts a word, doesn't he? Thou shalt not surely die. Verse 5, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here the serpent basically says to the woman, God is keeping something away from you that would be in your best interest to have. Never forget this. That is the oldest lie in the book. The devil wants you to believe that God is a withholder, but the Bible teaching is that God is a giver. Can someone say amen? I mean, that's the first lie. He says, oh, no, 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 no. God is keeping something back from you. And this is frankly what keeps many people out of making a full commitment to Christ, a full commitment to God, a full commitment to the Bible. They think, well, you know, I'm not sure. I'm afraid of what I'll have to give up. Beloved, it's not about what you give up. It's about what God gave up when he sent his son. Can you say amen? The, the, the great truth of the Bible is not that God is a withholder. He's not trying to keep things back from you. Anything that is in your best interest to have, he will give to you. But Satan says, no, 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 no. He knows that you'll become his gods, knowing good and evil. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. She gave also to her husband with her and he ate. You know the story. Adam eats of the tree. Eve eats of the tree. God comes down into the garden and we read verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, what did they do, everyone? Yes. Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Where normally they would run to God to greet him as their father. Now they're running from God, terrified, in fear. Now, God comes down into the garden. And there are three parties there. How many parties, everyone? You have Adam, you have Eve, and you have the serpent. God turns his attention to Adam. He asks him three questions. Where are you? Who told you that you were naked? And... Yeah, yeah. Uh, who, and, and I'm fixing it here. Where is it at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why did you eat of the tree? There it is. Then he turns to Eve and he asks her one question. What is this that thou hast done? 
And then he turns to the serpent and he doesn't ask any questions. Why? Because the serpent already knew the answers. He preaches a sermon to the serpent. Look at it in verse 14. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Now notice verse 15 because it's the first promise of Jesus in all of the Bible. The first messianic prophecy. Verse 15, God speaking to the devil. He says, I will put hatred between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Fascinating, isn't it? Here, basically, what's happening is that Adam and Eve had changed loyalties. They had changed what, everyone? Loyalties. loyalties. God had said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The devil had said, you will not surely die. Question, who did Adam and Eve believe? They believed Satan, that's exactly right. And in, in believing the words of Satan over the words of God, they had effectively changed their loyalties and changed their allegiance. So God comes down into the garden and he sees there, and this is the picture I'll try to paint in your mind so you can sort of understand it. The devil's got his arm around Eve, he's got his arm around Adam, and oh, they're just hanging out. Good old buddies. God comes into the garden and he asks Adam the three questions. He asks Eve the one question, then he looks at the devil and he says, you know what, you think you've won the day. It looks as though my children, my beautiful dear children, are all your friends now. They believed you more than believing me. But I'll tell you what, a day is coming. I'm going to put enmity between you and this woman. You, you think she's your best bud now. You think she's your best friend now. But I'm going to put enmity between you and this woman. And that enmity is going to crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. That enmity, the promised enmity that would crush the head of Satan is Jesus Christ himself. Can someone say amen? Yeah. Now, naturally, every one of us in our own hearts, in our natural condition, we are the friend of Satan and the enemy of God. You're saying, what? Did he really just say that? That's exactly what I just said. When we are born, we have built into us an inward selfishness. An inward what, everyone? selfishness. It's a carnality that is against the principles of God and of His law and of His love. This is easily illustrated. I have two beautiful little boys in the room just across the hallway. And uh, I love them very much and they are innocent. But you know what I mean when I say innocent. They're only relatively innocent. Those little boys are as selfish as the day is long and they didn't learn it from their papa and they didn't learn it from their mama. They learned it from Adam. Are you with me? Now think about that. You might have had the best child in the world, but what do you have to teach your children? Do you have to teach them how to share or how to keep some back from them for themselves because they're so busy giving everything away? You have to teach them how to share. That's exactly right. So you put little Sammy in little Sally's crib, and if little Sally has a banana, little Sammy, you don't have to teach him how to pick up the Tonka truck, hit her over the head, and take the banana. That's, that's right in the hard drive. She knows that. He knows that. That's part of, of what it means to be a child. Well, where did he get it from? The answer is he got it from his parents, who got it from his parents, from his parents, from his parents, all the way back to the first parents who changed their allegiance and their nature was basically transformed. To put it in the words of the Apostle Paul, he said the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. In another place, the Apostle Paul, Ephesians 2, he says that by nature, by what everyone? By nature, we're the children of wrath. That is to say, when we're born, the most important thing in the world is me. Does that make sense, everyone? Yes or no? I'm the most important thing in the world. And this world basically exists to serve me and my desires and my purposes. That's what happened there in the Garden of Eden. There was a transformation in the nature of man. And so God comes into the garden and he says, you think that she's loyal to you, Satan. You think that he's loyal to you, Satan. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to put hatred between you and the serpent. I'm going to put hatred between the woman and the serpent. And that hatred will crush your head. If this makes sense, say amen. amen. Now, I want you to notice that this is the first battle between Christ and Satan. The first battle on planet Earth. We're in Genesis chapter 
3, and here we find the first battle between God and Satan on planet Earth. The first battle. Go with me now to Revelation chapter. What chapter would we be in if we stepped one chapter this way from Revelation 21 and 22? Revelation 20. Open your Bible to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And notice this. Absolutely remarkable. Revelation chapter 20. It says in verse 9, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9, They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Fire came down from God out of heaven, and what did it do? It devoured them. Now look at verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the what, everyone? Lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Thus ends the history of Satan. Now, do you see it? Yes or no? It's so powerful. Over here, we have Eden. Over here, we have Eden restored. These are like two bookends on the Bible. But if we come just one chapter this way, we have the first battle between Christ and Satan. And if we come just one chapter this way, we have the what, everyone? Last battle. And so here we have a big picture overview of how to understand the Bible. The Bible is best understood against the backdrop of Eden to Eden and the first conflict and the last conflict. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. Everything in between, everything in between is God trying to get his people back to the Garden of Eden where he can live with them in face-to-face -face communion. Can someone say amen? amen? In fact, that's one of the great promises in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. It says, and they shall see his face. Powerful. Living in face-to-face -face communion with God. So we have Eden to Eden. But more than that, there is this battle theme. And all through the Bible, we find this wrestling, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, to quote Ephesians 6. Now go back to your study guide. Did you get all of those blanks filled in there? Should be pretty easy. Look now with me at the six stages of Revelation's great battle. I'm reading there. Now we will trace six distinct phases of this great battle and the eventual and promised victory of Jesus Christ right through the entire Bible. You will be amazed as you see this unfold right before your eyes. This is no make-believe battle. It is as real as the chair you are sitting on. Write out the six stages and give the Bible references for each one. We'll do our very best here to try and walk you through the six stages. We've already said the Bible is best understood with the backdrop of an Eden to Eden perspective and with a first battle, last battle perspective. I just want to hear a resounding amen if that makes sense. Okay, fantastic. Then let's look at the six stages of the great battle. Number one, the victory is declared. The scripture text we've already looked at, Genesis 3, 15. The victory is declared. That's where God stepped there into the garden and he says, you have won the battle, but you will not win the war. And so here, the first stage of the battle is that the victory is what, everyone? Declared. That's right. Now, the second stage is the victory is begun in the earthly ministry of Jesus. Open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, third book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 11. There are several passages that could be cited. We'll look at one. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 14. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 14. What verse, everyone? 14. And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was, Luke eleven fourteen. 14, when the demon had gone out, that the mute spoke, and the multitudes were amazed. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others, testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, now listen carefully to the words of Jesus. This is incredible. Verse 17, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, 
and a house divided against a house falls. Verse 18, if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say I cast out demons by Beelzebub. If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, notice this, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And then he tells a story, a parable, verse 21. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. Verse 22, I love this. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he has trusted and he divides his spoils. Do you follow Jesus' analogy here, yes or no? Very simple. Jesus heals this boy who was demon-possessed. He was mute. He couldn't speak. And Jesus walks up and he casts the demon out. People said, oh, you're doing this in the, in the name of Beelzebub. You're doing it by Beelzebub's power. Jesus says, you're not even thinking. I mean, think it through. If I was casting out demons by Beelzebub, that would mean that the devil is against the devil. And a house divided against itself cannot stand. He says, when a strong man guards his house, his goods are safe. But when a stronger than him comes and overcomes him, then you know that but what Jesus is saying is that the devil is being overcome. The devil is being what? Overcome. And so that's what we see in the earthly ministry of Jesus here. The victory that was promised in Eden is begun. Jesus was healing the blind. Jesus was casting out demons. Jesus was saying to the paralytic, rise, take up your bed and walk. And what I see in my mind's eye here is a picture of Jesus reclaiming. What's the word, everyone? Reclaiming what was rightfully His. Powerful. In fact, we actually looked at this in Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 6. We don't have to look at the whole chapter or the whole passage because we've already read it. Remember, Jesus heals that woman there and the ruler of the synagogue said, what? There are six days on which men ought to work. Come and, come and heal on one of those days and not on the Sabbath. Then remember what Jesus said, you hypocrite. Does not every one of you loose your ox or your donkey on the Sabbath? And then he said, ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham? Do you remember those four words? whom Satan has bound. Think of it, he says. Whom Satan has bound these many years be loosed from this burden on the Sabbath day. And so what we find in the earthly ministry of Jesus is that the victory that was promised in Eden, Jesus is reclaiming a brother. Jesus is reclaiming a woman. Jesus is reclaiming a child. He, in John chapter 11, he goes there to Lazarus' tomb. He says, Lazarus, come forth. He was reclaiming even from death. The victory was begun in the earthly ministry of Jesus. If this makes sense, say amen. amen. Okay. Jesus reclaiming his own. But the third stage of the victory is that the victory was achieved on the cross. The victory was achieved on the cross. Open your Bibles to the Gospel of John. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. The victory was declared in Eden... The victory was begun in the earthly ministry of Jesus, and the victory was achieved on the cross. Achieved on the cross. I'm in John chapter 12, and I'm reading in verse 31. John chapter 12, verse 31. Jesus speaking. He says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be what? cast out. Now, for you Bible students who are really paying attention, you're saying, whoa, that's interesting. That sounds just like Revelation chapter 12. Remember? Five times. He's cast out. He's cast out. He's cast out. He's cast out. Maybe I got to move like that. Okay. So I'll be careful not to go here. Okay. So he's cast out five times there in Revelation chapter 12. And notice now what Jesus says here. Look at it again. John chapter 12. You don't worry about me. I'll unbuckle unbuck my suit here. Maybe that'll help. So I'm not running into it. Okay. Does that help at all, Joel? Okay. So John chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. I'll hold still. That's going to be very difficult. <laughs> okay. Lord Jesus, help me. Now the ruler of this world will be cast. Look at verse 32. Bring me up that microphone and I'll just use that thing. Verse 32. Jesus says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw peoples unto myself. Oh, Nathan, you're a saint. Look at that. Okay. 
All right, are we good to go there? Ah, there we go. All right, I feel like I'm straight-jacketed now. I got something in my hand. Okay, notice what he says. Now is the judgment of this world right here, right now. Satan is cast out. And then he says in verse 32, when I'm lifted up on the cross, the devil is judged. The devil is cast out. If that makes sense, say amen. Now, there are several passages that I could quote here, but just write these down very quickly. John 14, verse 30. John 14, verse 30. And John 16, verse 11. So all of them in John. 1430 and 1611. So notice, the victory was declared in Eden. The victory was begun in the earthly ministry of Jesus. The victory was achieved on the what, everyone? On the cross. In fact, let me show you a text to that effect. When Jesus cried out on the cross, according to John chapter 19 and verse 30, he said, it is finished. That's right. The victory was achieved. At the cross, Satan was dealt a death blow. And we're going to be talking a lot more about that. In fact, we're going to see something in Revelation 12 that is so totally powerful. We'll see how much of it we can get into tonight, and we'll finish up what we can't tomorrow night. Look at this, Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. I really appreciate this particular translation. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Notice what Paul says. And the hostile princes and rulers he shook off from himself and boldly displayed them as his what? Conquest. Look at this. When by the cross he triumphed over them. Is that powerful, yes or no? The imagery here is absolutely incredible. Basically what he's saying is on the cross, Jesus made a fool out of the devil. Can you say amen? powerful. Now you say, well, how? How? What, what happened on the cross? Well, let's try and unpack that. But before we do that, let's go to the rest of the six stages. So the victory was declared in Eden. It was begun in the earthly ministry of Jesus. It was achieved on the cross, and the victory was proclaimed in the resurrection. Proclaimed in the what? Resurrection. Go to Acts chapter 2. You're there in John. It's the very next book. Acts chapter 2. Here we find the apostle Peter, Acts chapter 2. What's his name, everyone? Peter. And he's preaching on the day of Pentecost. The word Pentecost means 50, 50 days after the crucifixion. We'll pick it up in verse 22. Peter preaching. Preaching about the resurrection. He says, men of Israel, Acts 2, 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you, by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. Verse 23, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. Verse 24, whom God, what's the next words? Raised up, not... Uh, it says, uh, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, and now he quotes from David in the Old Testament, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I should not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption." You have made known to me the way of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Powerful. Basically, here Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost, and he begins to preach. Yes, Jesus was crucified. Yes, he was buried. But God raised him up. Can you say amen? amen. Powerful. Powerful. In fact, G.B. Hardy, in his book Countdown, said this. He said, there are only two essential requirements. Number one, has anyone ever cheated death? And number two, is it available to me? He said, let us survey the historical record. Buddha's tomb, occupied. Confucius' tomb, occupied. Muhammad's tomb, occupied. Jesus' tomb, empty. And then he said, argue as you will. But for me and my purposes, there is no point in following a loser. Now, when he said the word loser, he wasn't calling names like nanny nanny boo boo. What he was saying is this. There's this great enemy called death. Called what, everyone? Death. And we all will face it. And he wants to know, has anyone ever cheated death? 
when he says that Buddha was a loser and Confucius was a loser, he's saying they lost the battle with death. But Jesus was victorious over death. As Peter says, it was not possible that death could hold on to him. Why? Because he never sinned, and so death had no rightful claim to him. Can you say amen? Amen powerful. And so the victory was declared in the Garden of Eden. He said, one day I will crush your head. The victory was begun in the earthly ministry of Jesus when he as a stronger man began to take back the goods that Satan claimed as his own. Number three, the victory was achieved on the cross when he made a fool out of the devil. Number four, the victory was proclaimed in the resurrection. Fifth stage of the battle. Fifth stage, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the victory proclaimed. Here's the fifth stage of the battle. The victory is continued in the church. The victory is continued in God's church. You're still there in Acts. Go to Acts chapter 26. What chapter, everyone? 26. And I know you're trying to keep up with me. Do the best that you can. If I go too fast tonight, go out there, tell them I went too fast and get yourself a free CD. Okay? You say, I couldn't follow that message. No problem. Hey, listen, I I want you to understand this. Can you say amen? So if you don't get it, come back tomorrow night. Say, hey, listen, he went too fast. I need a free CD. They won't give you a hard time. They'll give you a free CD. Okay? Here we go. Acts chapter 26. I'm reading in verse 16. Here the Apostle Paul is recounting his conversion experience when he was on the road to Damascus and he was knocked off of his horse by Jesus of Nazareth. Acts 26 and verse 16. But rise and stand on your feet. Pick it up in verse 15. I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, Saul, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. Now look at verse 18. This is the powerful verse. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to what, everyone? Light. And from the power of Satan to God. Why? So that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by putting their faith in me. Isn't that powerful? You see what he's saying? He says, get up off your feet. I got a plan for you. You're going to be a minister and a witness. I need you to go tell these Gentile folks that I'm real, that I'm alive, that I'm raised, that I'm resurrected. Turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God. And so the victory is continued in the church. And if I could be very, very, very frank with you, the victory is to be continued in your life. The victory is to be continued in your life. God has called you in the very same way that he called Paul. God has called you to communicate the great good news of the risen Christ to your coworkers, to your family members, to your friends, to your grocer, to your banker, to whoever. Let them know that Jesus is alive. The victory declared, hallelujah. The victory was declared there in Eden. I will crush your head. The victory was begun in the earthly ministry of Jesus. The victory was achieved where, everyone? On the cross. That's right. Never forget that. The victory achieved on the cross. The victory was proclaimed in the resurrection. The victory is continued in the church. And the victory is concluded The victory is concluded in Revelation, and we already read that. When the devil himself is cast into the lake of fire. There are the six stages of the great battle. Can you say amen? Powerful. The victory declared and begun and achieved and proclaimed and continued and concluded. The end of Satan and the victory will be concluded. You say, whoo, we made it through. No, my timer says I got seven and a half minutes left. So look at the last page there. Go to the last page. You, you thought we were stopping and you were wrong. Last page of your study guide. Buckle your safety belts. Here we go. Back to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation what chapter, everyone? 12. I told you we had a lot to cover. But by the grace of God, you're going to understand it. Amen. You're going to like it, whether you like it or not. (laughs) Revelation chapter 12. Now look at this. Did you catch the significance? I'm reading directly from the study guide here. Did you catch the significance of the third stage? 
It is essential that you do. Remember Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. What word occurs three times? Cast or cast out. Note also that the same word appears in verses 10 and 13, as we've already said, five times. Clearly, this is an important truth. Now, when did this event take place? We already read that in John chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. I'll quote it for you again. Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 31, now, what's that word, everyone? Now. Now, let me ask you just a real quick question so we can be clear on this. Who wrote the gospel of John? John, good for you. Who wrote the book of Revelation? John, that's exactly right. And if you read Revelation and you read the gospel of John, you'll see there are many similarities in the language. Have you noticed that, yes or no? And so notice this. Here it says, Revela or pardon me, John chapter 12, verse 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. When Jesus and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus says, in the context of the cross, the devil was cast out of heaven. Does that make sense? You say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought he was cast out of heaven long before that. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole, the, the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, what's the next word? Now. now. Same word. Now. What has come now? Salvation. salvation. Question. When did salvation come? On the cross, of course. Salvation comes to us from the cross. He goes on to say salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ have come. Now think about it. When did all of those things come? Salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Where were all of those things manifested? On the cross. That's exactly right. Salvation, strength, the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. It goes on to say, have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Now look at this. Verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Where was the blood of the lamb shed? On the cross. You're getting it. And by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Now, verse 12 begins with the word, therefore. Does everyone see that? Yes or no? Yes. Now, beloved, when you see the word therefore in the Bible, ask yourself, hey, what's that therefore? <laughs> did you get that? When you see the word therefore, say, hey, what's that therefore? The word therefore is a concluding remark. It's a what, everyone? <laughs> concluding remark. Think about it if I say point number one, point number two, point number three. Therefore, you know that what I'm going to say after that is based on what I said before that. If this makes sense, everyone say amen. So look at verse 12. What's the first word of verse 12? Therefore, watch this. Rejoice. Be careful. Don't rejoice yet. Rejoice who, according to that verse? Who? Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth. How many people here today live on earth? Just raise your hand. Okay. Anybody here? Anybody here live in heaven? I didn't say in heavenly places. I said in heaven. Now, according to that verse then, should we be rejoicing or should we be saying woe? According to that verse, it says, Rejoice, O heavens, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. Why? Because the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Why? Because he knows he has a short time. Question, how does he know he has a short time? Because of the cross. He died on the cross, Jesus was raised, and he suddenly knows, uh-oh, this game is almost over. Now look at verse 13. Powerful. It says, now when the dragon saw, that is when the dragon perceived that he had been, what everyone? Cast to the earth. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. He went with all of his energy, with all of his vigor, with all of his enthusiasm after the church. 
And in verse 17, this satanic attack reaches its logical and pathetic climax. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. Now, did you get all of the blanks filled in there in the first paragraph? Look at the second paragraph. <laughs> I'll help you fill them in. It says, because at the cross, perfect love and perfect hate stood face to face, the holy character and nature of God stood in direct contrast with the selfish character and nature of Satan. Perfect love and perfect evil had a stare down and perfect love in the face of Jesus Christ prevailed. Can you say amen? Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to pause. You're going to say, what? He can pause? Yeah, I can pause until tomorrow night. We're going to hit the pause button because remember, this is the war behind the wars. What were those next two words? Part one. And tomorrow night is the war behind the wars, part two. But beloved, let's be crystal clear on what we're saying tonight. Number one, there is a great cosmic conflict between Christ and Satan. Can you say amen? That war began in heaven and will be finished on earth. We saw the Eden to Eden and the battle to battle perspective. Then we looked at those six stages, but what we're doing now is we're honing in on that third stage, the victory achieved on the cross. At the cross, Satan was cast out. You say, well, what does that mean for me today? Tomorrow night, we will unpack this still further, and Revelation chapter 12 will literally come alive. But as for me tonight, I want to say with Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Let's pray together as we close. Father in heaven, tonight you've been with us. It's been a high energy meeting. But Father, we've made it through and, and many of us have a clearer understanding now of this great cosmic conflict between Christ and Satan. We see that it's not some manufactured battle, not some make-believe battle. It's a battle that we are right in the center of. Father in heaven, we want to be victorious, and we believe by faith in Jesus Christ that we will be victorious. But Father, bring us back tomorrow so we can understand still more thoroughly, more completely, more biblically, and more powerfully just what this war behind the wars entails. We ask it in the wonderful, righteous, holy name of Jesus, our Savior, your Son. Let all of the people say, Amen. Amen.